Hello, so today we're going to start by practicing with one example of the definition that we gave last time. So remember that last time we talked about a uh, definition of big O and we said that uh, big O of G of N is equal to the set of all functions F that go from natural numbers to positive real numbers such that the function f of n is less than or equal to c times g of n. And we said here that for a c which is greater than 0. Notice in this case c greater than 0 could be any value, 2, 3, 10, 10.5, whatever value, as long as it's greater than 0. So using this definition, I first want to solve the following example. So we're going to show that 3n squared plus 1 is in big O of n squared, All right? So easy just to see how to use the definition and see how can we find the value of c. So in order to show this, I have to show that f of n satisfies this condition. So in this case, clearly this would be our f of n and this would be our g of n, right? according to the definition, because I want to show that f of n is in a big O of g of n. So in order to do this, then this means that I should it should satisfy this definition. So I'm going to write down the definition, which would be 3n squared plus 1, less than or equal to c times g of n, which is just n squared. So if we take a look at this uh, equation, well, inequality that I have here, from here we can see that uh, if I want to solve this for the c, so I leave the c alone, I can divide every, everything by n squared. Now n squared is a positive number, cannot be zero, so I can actually divide and keep the inequality. So dividing by n squared, I get 3 plus 1 over n squared less than or equal to c. So for this to be true, I can pick a value of c, right? So if I pick a value of c equals to 4, notice that 1 over n squared is always less than or equal to 1 because the maximum possible value of n is 1. So 1 over n squared is going to always be less than or equal to 1. So if I add a 3 on both sides, I end up with 3 plus 1 over n squared less than or equal to 4. So if I pick c equals 4, then um, the condition is going to be satisfied. So since the condition is satisfied, meaning that this condition is satisfied, right? So for a value of c equals to 4, now c equals to 4, the only condition that I have is that c is greater than 0. So clearly 4 is greater than 0, so it satisfies the condition. And therefore, we can safely say that uh, 3n squared plus 1 is in big O of n squared. All right, so this is an example to clarify a little bit why we mean, what we mean by this value of c. And so the idea is basically we're going to say this is satisfied. And then from here, we're going to try to find what the value of c is that makes this condition true. And if the value of c that makes this condition true can be found and that value is greater than zero, then we can say that f of n is in this set, is in big O of g of n. All right, so if we remember from last time, what we wanted is we wanted to show that we can classify functions. According to their growth rate, And for that, we wanted to use theta. Remember the definition of theta. So the idea is that if we have the set of all possible functions, these functions can be classified. So I'm going to have here a section, a partition of functions, where uh, they are in the order of n squared, let's say. Then I have some other section here where I have 
linear functions that are in the order of n, and then I have another section here, and so on. So this would be to classify functions. So if, for example, I give a function um, 3n squared plus 1, we know that this function is going to be in this part here, which is in theta of n squared. All right, so, but in order to show that this is true, I need to show that theta, the definition that we provided, when seen as a relation, is an equivalence relation. So I posted uh, some discrete math, math notes. So I hope that you were able to see them so that you can find out why is it that whenever we have an equivalence relation, then the equivalence relation always partitions the set on which it is defined into equivalence classes. So in our case, the equivalence classes are going to be the little subsets, the little partitions in which the set of all functions is going to be uh, divided. So in order to do this, I need to show that theta, seen as a relation, is an equivalence relation. So in order to show that something is an equivalence relation, we need to show three properties. The first property is that it is reflexive. Second property, that it's symmetric. And third property, that it is transitive. So let's start by showing that it is reflexive. So first condition, theta is reflexive. So in order to show that theta is reflexive, we need to show that it satisfies the following condition, that f is in theta of f, right? This is the condition for it to be reflexive. So the definition, let me write here the definition of theta so that we have it on hand if we want to use it. So we say that theta of g is equal to the set of all functions. We know where they go, so I'm just going to write an abbreviated version of this, such that the function is in between c1g and c2g. So this is the definition where c1 and c2 are actually greater than zero. So positive numbers, doesn't matter how big they are, but they have to be positive numbers. All right, so this is the definition that we are going to use. So clearly, um, if we write it like this, so we can write that f is in between c1f and c2f, where c1 equals c2 equals 1, and so this condition is satisfied when c1 and c2 are equal to 1, in which case both are greater than 0, and so um, this is going to be true. So the uh, theta is going to be reflexive. Second condition that we want to show is that theta is symmetric. So in order to show that theta is symmetric, we have to show that if f is in theta of g, then g is in theta of f. All right, so assuming that uh, you already saw the, the uh, lecture notes that I posted about uh, discrete math, so you know how to make proofs, right? Because it has a huge section talking about how to do proofs. So we're going to assume that this is true. So assume that f is in theta of g. So this means that I can use the definition. So f satisfies the definition. So this means that f is in between c1g and c2g. So it satisfies the definition. So if we take a look at this side, this implies that um, g is less than or equal to 1 over c1f. And if we take a look at this side, this implies that this is a semicolon. This implies that uh, 1 over c2 is less than or equal to g. So um, 1 over c2f, uh, right, less than or equal to g. So combining these two and using g, which is in the middle, so we see that g is less than is greater than or equal to. So looking at this side, 
g greater than or equal to 1 over c2 f which is in turn less than or equal to 1 over c1 f all right so uh this actually you can see that 1 over c1 here we can call it let's say k1 and 1 over c2 here sorry 1 over c2 can be called k1 and 1 over c1 draw this carefully can be called k2 so this actually satisfies the definition so this implies that g is in theta of f right satisfies exactly the same definition that we have here but now the roles are reversed g is f and f is g so that proves that uh, theta is symmetric so, so the last one that we want to prove is we want to prove that it is transitive So three, we want to show that um, theta is transitive. So remember, we have to show that if f is in theta of g and g is in theta of h, then this and then f is in theta of h. So we have to show that. So we're going to assume that this condition is true. Those two things happen. So assume that f is in theta of g. If f is in theta of g, then f is going to be in between c1g and c2g. And we are also going to assume the other condition, which says that g is in theta of h. And so this means that G is going to be in between C1H, uh, well, not C1 in this case, that should be C3, right? I'm C1, C2, C3H, uh, and C4H. All right, so based on these two, on this one here, I can conclude that uh, G is less than or equal to 1 over C1F, okay? And then let me check uh, this one on this side here. So now uh, from this side here, we have that G is greater than or equal to C3H. So let me write it down here, greater than or equal to C3H. Right, so um, combining those two, I can write C3H less than or equal to one over C1F. All right, so on the other hand, I have uh, the following. So I have from here that f is less than or equal to c2g. So based on this one, I have that um, 1 over c2f is less than or equal to g. And in the, on this side here, I have that g is less than or equal to uh, c4h. So g less than or equal to c4h. So if I combine these two, I get um, 1 over C2F less than or equal to C4H. Okay, so now from here, I have the following. I have uh, C1, C3H is less than or equal to F. And in here, I have that F is less than or equal to C2, C4H. So combining these two, I have then that f is uh, greater than or equal to c1, c3h on this side and less than or equal to c2, c4h on this side. So you see that um, these two, this one is a constant, let me call this k1 and this is a constant also, call it k2. Notice also that these two constants, k1 and k2, are greater than zero. Why? Because c1, c2, c3, and c4, all of them are all of them are greater than zero. So the products are going to be numbers that are greater than zero too. So since k1 and k2 are greater than zero, then this implies that. Let me bring the board down a little bit. So this implies that. Um, K1H less than or equal to F less than or equal to K2H. And this is actually the definition where F is in theta of H. 
So this actually shows that I assume that I assume that f is in theta of g and g is in theta of h, and then eventually I conclude that f is in theta of h. So that concludes the proof that theta, that theta is transitive. So since theta is transitive, satisfies uh, all three conditions. It's uh, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Therefore, theta is an equivalence relation, and so it partitions the set of functions into equivalence classes, and basically we are done proving what we wanted to prove. I uh, remember that we were able to use uh, the definition in order to show that 3n squared plus 1 is in big O of n squared. And remember that we use the definition, and in order to use the definition, we try to find the actual value of c such that c is greater than 0. Well, this method is really hard to, to do for complicated functions. So it is much easier if we try to use a different approach. So a different approach is using limits. So remember from calculus, we are going to use limits here. All right, so uh, we take the following limit. So we're going to compare two functions. We want to compare f of n. We want to compare, let me put them here, compare f of n to g of n. So to determine where is where is the function f, f could be in big big O of g, or f could be in theta of g, or f could be in, in omega of g, or in little o, or in little omega, and so on. So we need to find out where this function f is with respect to that. So we're going to compare those two functions. So in order to compare those two functions, what we can do is we can take, we can divide them and compute f of n divided by g of n. And we notice what happens because we're comparing them by growth rate. If function g of n grows much faster than f of n, when it goes to infinity, when n goes to infinity, then this grows to, to infinity much faster than f of n. And so the, the, the limit of this is going to be zero. So I'm going to write here limit when n goes to infinity of f of n over g of n. And so there are several choices here. First one that I just mentioned is what happens when uh, g of n grows much faster than f of n. If g of n grows much faster than f of n, then that means that uh, g of n is going to be an upper bound for f of n. And so we have that. So if this is equal to zero, then that means that f of n is going to be where? Remember, think about it. Think about it, right? G of n is an upper bound for f of n. Remember the little diagram that we had last time? So this, is, this means that this is in little o of g of n. Now, why is this little o? Uh, we know that it has to be little o because this actually grows strictly faster than f of n. They are not growing at the same growth rate. So the other option is that the limit goes to infinity. So if this limit goes to infinity, then that means that f of n is growing strictly faster than g of n. So that means that f of n is now, well, g of n is now going to be a lower bound for f of n. And if g of n is a lower bound for f of n, then we use big omega, right? So, but in this case, it's going to be little omega. Again, same reason because they cannot have the same growth rate because the limit is infinity, meaning that this function actually grows strictly faster than this other function. So this is going to be omega of g of n. And then finally, there is the other choice, which is what happens is this is a constant. So if I take the limit and it happens to be a constant, then we know that both functions actually grow at the same growth rate, which is theta of g of n. So we can know how the functions are going to be growing based on uh, computing the limit. So let me do a little example. So again, same example. Show that 3n squared plus 1 is in, uh, in this case, I'm going to show that it is in theta of n squared. So in order to show this, I can compute the limit. So take limit when n goes to infinity. And I'm going to uh, compare them by dividing them, right? 
3n squared, so this is f, this is g, this is f, this is g, 3n squared plus 1 divided by n, which is equal to the limit when n goes to infinity of 3n squared over n squared, sorry, n squared. This is equal to 3 plus 1 over n squared, and the limit here of 1 over n squared is 0, so this is equal to 3, which is a constant, and therefore what we wanted to show is true, and 3n squared plus 1 is in theta of n squared. All right, so um, now that we know how to do uh, this uh, comparison of functions, what I want to do is I want to go through some of the functions that are very useful in computer science, and I'm going to write them ordered by growth rate, and then we're going to prove some of those, uh, that some of those growth rates are actually correct. So continuing here, let me call this common functions. that are going to be used in computer science. So the first one uh, that I want to talk about is a constant. So we we'll represent a constant by using one. So theta of one, this is the representative of the function, of the, fu of the set of functions. So basically this is giving me uh, the equivalence class where all these functions are. So for example, function number three, 3 is going to be in theta of 1. Function number 3.5 is going to be in theta of 1, and so on. So this is how we are going to represent constants. Uh, logarithmic functions are going to be represented by using theta of log of n. And in this case, uh, just a clarification with respect to what, how we write logarithms. If we write log, that means we're taking log to the base 10. If we are writing, so this is equivalent to that, if I'm writing ln, that is natural log, which is equivalent to log to the base e, and if we write lg, that's equivalent to writing logarithm to the base 2. So if I'm writing lg, that means this is logarithm to the base 2 of n. So we have to keep that in mind, because at some point we want to compute the derivative of logarithms, and so since this is... Uh, log to the base 2, then there is a little extra logarithm that I we have to, com to consider when writing the derivative. So we have logarithmic functions, then we have another one that are called polylog functions, or polylogarithmic functions, uh, which are in the order of log to the k of n, where k is um, usually going to be considered something that I want is for this one to actually grow faster than that one, so I'm going to ask for k greater than 1, in this case, for a polylogarithmic function. Then we have linear functions, which we all know, which is just in the order of n. We have quadratic functions, which is in the order of n squared. Then we have polynomial functions, which are functions in the order of n to the k. And in this case, we're going to assume that k can be any number greater than zero. But if we want this organization, this sorted uh, version to be complete, uh, this was n squared. So basically, I would ask here to, for k to be greater than two. But that's not necessary, right? For a polynomial to be a polynomial function, it doesn't matter what the exponent here is. As long as it's a positive number, we are fine. All right, so uh, we have exponential function. Exponential function would be in theta of uh, b to the n, where this b is uh, greater than 1. Notice that b has to be greater than 1 because if b is less than 1, for example, if this is 0. 0.5 to the n, that function is not going to be, well, it's actually going to be a decreasing function and we want only functions that are non-decreasing based on what we said in our last lecture, right? And then finally, we have a factorial function. And factorial functions are in the order of n factorial. That's the representative for factorial function. Okay, so um, these are ordered. 
in order of uh, increasing um, growth rate. So growth rate goes in this way. So if we want to actually show that, we would have to show that, um, for example, this function here is an upper bound for this function here. And then this function here is an upper bound for this function here. And this function here is an upper bound for this function here. All right, so in order to show that, I would have to show first uh, that one happens to be in a little o of log of n. And then I have to show that log of n is in little o of log to and so on. So we are going to be able to show all that in just a second. So the first one that we're going to prove is we're going to prove that one is in little o of log of n. Right, so in order to show this, we're going to show, remember this is f, this is g. So we take the limit when n goes to infinity of 1 over log of n. And uh, when n goes to infinity, log of n goes to infinity too. So this goes to infinity, and therefore this entire thing goes to 0. So this is going to be equal to 0. And if we recall, then that means that this condition is true. Remember that in order for it to be in little o, as we said, um, limit of f over g when n goes to infinity has to be equal to zero, and when that happens, then f is in little o of g. So for most of the examples that I'm going to do, I want to show that the limit of f divided by g is equal to zero. So that is our first example. Our second example, is now we want to show that log of n, so log of n is uh, in little o of log of to the k of n, where k is greater than 1, as we said before. And so in order to show this, we take limit when n goes to infinity of f of n, which is log of n, divided by log to the k of n, which is equal to the limit when n goes to infinity of uh, 1 over log to the k minus 1 of n, but since k is greater than 1, then that means that k minus 1 is greater than 0, and so this part here goes to infinity and the entire limit goes to 0, so this is equal to 0, and so we are done uh, with the second proof. Let me do a third one, but we're going to need a little bit more space, so let me go to next page. So for the third one, we want to show that uh, the polar log, so log to the k of n is in little o of n. So notice this is very interesting. Doesn't matter how big the k is, when we have a logarithm function, it is always going to be bounded from above by n. So n is actually an upper bound for uh, a logarithmic function, no matter what how big the value of k is. So my only condition in the case that I want to show here is that k is actually greater than or equal to zero. So that is, well, actually greater than zero, right? <clears throat> greater than zero, because if it's equal to zero, we don't really, are not really interested in this because this would be like a constant function and we already were able to show that this is true for a constant function. So in this case, what we want to show is we want to show that the limit when n goes to infinity of uh, f, which is log to the k of n divided by n, we want to show that this is equal to zero. All right, but we have a little bit of a problem here, right? Because um, logarithm to the k of n divided by n, both cases, the numerator when n goes to infinity goes to infinity, and the denominator also goes to infinity when n goes to infinity. So in order to uh, break this tie, we have to use what? Remember from calculus, we have to use L'Hopital's rule. So using L'Hopital's rule, we have to compute the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. So we have derivative of the numerator, that is k times log to the k minus 1 of n times the derivative of log, so times the derivative of log of n. The derivative of log of n is 1 over n times 1 over natural log of 2 because the base of this logarithm that we're using is logarithm to the base 2. And so this now divided by the derivative of n with respect to n, which is equal to 1. So we're writing uh, this by removing the constant, putting the constants outside of the limit. 
So those functions, those values that do not depend of n, I'm going to put them outside of the limit. I have two of them. I have uh, this k uh, here. Let me use a different color. So uh, this k and we have 1 over natural log of 2. So those two do not depend of n, so I can take them outside of the limit. So this is going to be equal to, and I have a k over natural log of 2 times the limit when n goes to infinity of log to the k minus 1 of n divided by n. All right, so this is what we get now. So we used L'Hopital's rule, and we actually apparently didn't go anywhere because we still have a numerator and a denominator, and both of them go to infinity. So that means that I have to apply L'Hopital's rule again. So now what I did here is actually I applied L'Hopital's rule once, right? So let me put here. Uh, this was because I applied L'Hopital's rule one. Okay, so let me put it here. L'Hopital's rule was applied once. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule again. So every time that I apply L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to get rid of a 1 from here. And I'm going to keep going until this number reaches something close to 0. Okay? And we're going to then see that there might be several, still two cases to consider. So applying L'Hopital's rule again. So let me put here number 2, meaning that I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule for a second time. So applying L'Hopital's rule for a second time, you perform the derivative. I'm just going to write, uh, based on what I see here, we know what we're, what we're going to get, right? So basically, if we take the derivative of this, this is going to be k minus 1 times log uh, to the k minus 2 of n and times the derivative. So it's going to appear with another natural log of 2. n derivative is 1, but we are still going to get our 1 over n the same as before because we are uh, computing the derivative of log of n. So basically what we're going to get is the following. We get k, uh, k minus 1, divided by natural log of 2 squared, and the limit when n goes to infinity. And now we have log, nat log to base 2 uh, to the k minus 2 of n divided by n. So this was applying L'Hopital's rule two times. Notice that when I apply L'Hopital's rule uh, two times, uh, this k becomes, well, k minus, the original k that was here now is transformed into k, k minus 2. So if I continue here and applying L'Hopital's rule many times, so eventually I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule how many times? I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule k times so that this goes away. The problem is that I cannot apply it exactly k times because k, I don't know if it's an integer or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply it a little bit more than k times if it's not an integer. So that means that I'm going to apply it k times, but since I cannot apply it a number that is not integer of times, then it's going to be applied the ceiling of k. Remember that the ceiling function The ceiling function is going to round up. So if I have 4.2, the ceiling of 4.2 is 5, right? Ceiling of uh, 4.9 is also 5. Ceiling of 4 is 4. Okay, so now uh, we're applying the ceiling function here. So that's the number of times that we apply this. So applying it a ceiling of uh, n times, we get the following. So let me write down what goes inside of the limit. So it's the limit when n goes to infinity of uh, log to the k minus. So I applied it once, L'Hopital rule once, and I got k minus 1. Applied L'Hopital rule twice, I got k minus 2. So applied L'Hopital rule, ceiling of k times. So I get k minus the ceiling of k. And so of n, and this divided by n. Right now, what goes outside? Outside, I have k, k minus 1. Notice that this k minus 1, well, in here, I have k, which is actually one more than k minus 1. I have k minus 1, which is actually one more than k minus 2. 
So this goes all the way to one more than whatever I have given the exponent. So which is k minus ceiling of k plus 1. And that is going to be divided by... So when we apply L'Hopital rule once, we got natural log of 2. When we apply L'Hopital rule twice, we got natural log of 2 squared. If we apply uh, if we apply L'Hopital rule k ceiling of k times, this is going to be natural log to the ceiling of k of n. Of, uh, sorry, this is a 2, right? Of two. All right, so this is what we get. So what is this equal to, right? So um, we have two choices for k. So in order to find out what this is equal to, there are actually two possible cases. So case number one uh, is in the case where k is integer. All right, so let me uh, continue on our next word. Right, so this is what we had from our previous slide. So um, I want to actually show what the value of this is. So I have case one, k is an integer. So if k is an integer, then that implies that uh, the ceiling of k is actually equal to k, which means that k minus the ceiling of k, which is the value that I have here, is actually equal to zero. Now, if this value is equal to zero, then this is log to the zero of n, which is actually equal to one, so this is one over n, right? So we have uh, the, the limit that we want, so it's equal to, so this is our original limit, okay? That limit is equal to all this thing, which is actually a big constant, so let me mark it here. All this thing is just a big constant. Let me call it C. So we have uh, C times the limit when N goes to infinity of this log to the K minus K, which is equal to uh, one, we said, divided by N. And this is just equal to zero. And we are done in the case where K is an integer. In the second case, K is not an integer. So if k is not an integer, then that means that the ceiling of k has to be greater than k. Is that right? Because if k is, for example, 4.1, then the ceiling of k is going to be 5. So this is always greater, but they cannot be equal because the only case where the ceiling of k is equal to k is when k is an integer. So in case that it's not an integer, this is what is going to happen. And this implies that uh, the ceiling of k minus k is actually greater than zero. So from here, again, we have that the limit is equal to, so it's a big constant, so it's equal to c limit when n goes to infinity of what? I can put this in the denominator, so this looks like this, 1 divided by log ceiling of k minus k. Remember, I can move this to the denominator just by making the exponent negative, and this is times n, right? But since we know that k minus, ceiling of k minus k is actually positive, according to what we have here, then uh, the limit of this, when n goes to infinity, goes also to infinity, n also goes to infinity, and one over something that goes to infinity is equal to zero, and so we are done again. All right, so in both cases, it's equal to zero, which means that this limit is equal to zero, and since that limit is equal to zero, then that implies that log to the k of n is in little o of n, and this is exactly what we wanted to show. All right, so this is uh, the second exercise that we did. Let me show the third one. So next we would want to show that um, n is in little o of n squared. Remember from where we um, were writing all our functions, this is very easy. 
Uh, then we would have to show that uh, n squared is in little o of n to the k, which is also very easy. Then we will need to show that n to the k is in little o of b to the n. Right? And this can be done using L'Hopital's rule again. I'm not going to do this, okay? It's, uh, it's easy. You can check this on the lecture notes. I'm going to post them. And then we have... Uh, B of n is in little o of n factorial. The ones with n factorial are kind of hard to do. Uh, in lecture notes, I have it for the case of p equals 2. So I actually show that 2 to the n is in little o of n factorial. So n factorial is an upper bound for 2 to the n, so n factorial is worse than 2 to the n. So um, the factorial function is kind of a difficult function to deal with. Uh, because it's n times n plus one times n minus one and it's times n minus two and so on. So um, what usually people do in order to try to um, find approximations for factorial functions is to use uh, something that is called a Stirling approximation. I'm not going to prove the Stirling approximation, but I think it's important for you to know that the factorial function uh, can be um, generalized to all real numbers. Remember that factorial function satisfies basically two things. Uh, the first thing is that zero factorial is equal to one, and then uh, we can recursively define factorial function in such a way, let me write it as factorial like this, fact, okay? So not like this, so I'm going to write it like this, factorial of n. So we can write it like this, factorial of n, is equal to n times factorial of n minus 1. So this is a recursive definition of my factorial function, and those two conditions actually define the entire factorial function, but only for, uh, in, the, in the case of integer numbers. It is possible to generalize this using what is called the gamma function. So the gamma function, using that, we get the following. We have that factorial of n is equal to an integral that goes from 0 to infinity of uh, x to the n e to the minus x dx. It is not hard to show that this satisfies these two conditions. So if I replace this with a 0 here, I can very easily show that this integral is equal to 1. And by using integration by parts, it is easy to show that this also satisfies this condition. So that the factorial of n is equal to n times the factorial of n minus 1 by using the same definition. All right, so try to do that as an exercise. I'm also going to post them in lecture notes if uh, you might not uh, uh, be able to do that on your own, but uh, it should be easy to do integrating by parts. All right, so if you integrate this by parts, you are going to be able to show that this is a generalization of the factorial function. So it behaves exactly in the same way as the factorial function does in the case of integers, but you, there is no restriction here for the value of n. The value of n can be any number, not necessarily an integer. It could be even negative value. So this is a generalization of the factorial function. Using this generalization, it is possible to end up with a Stirling approximation. And the Stirling approximation basically tells me um, a bound for n factorial. So uh, it tells me that, well, it, it says that n factorial is approximately equal to the square root of 2 pi n times n divided by e where e is the base of uh, natural uh, logs, to the n. So you can see from here that there is this value that appears, which is actually n to the n. So n factorial, this tells me, okay, probably n factorial is in theta of n log n, right? So this is something that eventually I'm going to ask uh, as an exercise question, probably in the homework, uh, or in a quiz. Okay, so um, 
I guess that's all for today. And um, I will talk to you then next lecture. All right. Thank you. Bye.